Uh, so I'm going to invite our students who are going to Montreal, as well as the, uh, the leaders who are going with them to come forward. And maybe you can just kind of join me up here without kicking any cords, okay? So a few points here, folks. Um, first of all, thank you very much for uh, your financial and your uh, prayer and and, uh, and moral support for this cruise they've gotten ready to go. They've been actually quite overwhelmed with uh, the, your financial support, especially the money they raised, which is awesome. Second of all, um, if you are uh, a family member of someone up here or, or a friend and you want to keep up to date with what they're up to this week, check Facebook. Stephen said he's going to be giving us an update uh, every night on Facebook, so you can kind of follow their journey there. Um, and uh, they are planning on reporting back to our community on August the 7th about uh, what they saw, what they did, and most importantly, what they learned and how they grew. And uh, as a parent and a member of the community, you know, it is, it is really exciting to watch our young people grow physically and intellectually and spiritually. And uh, we know uh, that this week is going to be a huge week of growth. And these young folks you see in front of us here are gonna come back different than they are today. So we're very excited about that. Uh, the volunteer leaders and Stephen, they're gonna come back different too. <laughs> and, uh, and we're really, really grateful for the role that these leaders play in our students' lives and in our, in our community life together. And so uh, I want to just um, ask you to join me now in, uh, in praying for this team and, uh, and if you want, we, we do this and it, and it feels good. Sometimes we just, we just put a hand up like this from where you sit and, and we can feel that, that we can feel the blessing of the Holy Spirit coming to the team, okay? So let's pray together. God, thank you so much for uh, these students, all the young people we have in this church. They bless us, we learn from them. They are important to us, they're important people in this community. And so we're grateful. And we're grateful for this opportunity for them to go to Montreal to learn, experience, sense your closeness. They will sense your closeness at some point on this trip. We, we pray for that. And, uh, and we bless them in your name with uh, health and safety and growth and learning. And we bless the leaders too. Thank you for their willingness to step up. We ask your blessing on them as well for health and safety and stamina energy to help our kids and our students as they grow. So we commit the trip uh, to your name, in your name, and to your glory. In Christ's name. Amen. Awesome. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope, no more place to be. Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only you he remains My orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance when death was arrested in my life began Oh, your grace so free Washes over me You have made me new Now life begins with you It's your endless love Pouring down
It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. I see your display on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoices, though heaven applauds. And Jesus arose with our freedom. Death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down. Hello, my name is Ryan Erd. I'm a cisgendered white male. I have short dark hair, brown eyes, and today I'm wearing a plaid top and black jeans. My pronouns are he and him. I am privileged for many reasons because my ancestors settled on treaty land and other reasons. I currently live on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe peoples shared by Treaty 49.5. I'm committed to learning and acting and as an ally for all marginalized, marginalized people. If some of that seems strange to you, don't worry. You're not alone. Learning to be inclusive, even when you formally introduce yourself, is a journey. Yet it's one of great importance for all of us. The words we say really matter. Yet it's hard. Change is hard. It's hard to understand what it really means to live as someone who's different than yourself. We think of that as normal or right, even though it may not be. It can also feel threatening to acknowledge another's lack of opportunity, especially if and when you feel it may cost some of your own. Embracing diversity or creating belonging takes work and humility. Today's message is actually inspired by our covenant, where the first commitment is belonging. Creating and nurturing a culture where all people can experience belonging regardless of their gender, ethnicity, age, or sexual orientation. And today, I'm actually suggesting a minor addition. I think we should add income to that list. And that'll be our particular focus as we go through the message. So as we Look at this, I want to draw your attention to a particular passage of scripture that's familiar to some of you, I'm sure. Matthew 25, 14 to 30, reads like this. It's called the parable of the bags of gold. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two, and to another one, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold um, brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. 
I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold and see, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that, the har the har that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put the money on deposit at, with the bankers. So at least when I returned, it would have received interest. So take the bag of gold from him, give it to the one who has 10. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even when, when they have, will be taken from them. And throw the worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Always seemed a bit harsh to me. Wow. How many sermons have you heard on this passage over the years? I can recall a few. And basically what I remember is that we are asked not to waste our God-given abilities, that we perhaps should listen to our masters, take reasonable risks, and that we should be ready when the master returns. I've assumed that the servants who invest and are praised have done the right thing. I've assumed that Jesus is the master. At one time, I also assumed that the message was to behave this way and I will get into heaven. Does it ring a bell to any of your thoughts about that passage? Now, sometimes, unfortunately, I've heard people to use this passage to justify the way our capitalist economy works. Invest wisely and you will get more. And if you don't, you reap what you sow. Sometimes I've heard people use this passage to justify why people with low income don't deserve to go into heaven, or perhaps less directly, noting that their laziness is actually the cause of their own poverty. These views, somehow justified by one interpretation of a parable, continue to cause significant harm through economic exclusion each and every day. Well, how about another way to think about it? Richard Rohrbach in the Biblical Archaeology Review suggests an alternative. He begins by reminding us that an ancient Eastern audience would see things quite differently than we do. I think we know that. We've heard that said before. But do we really understand what it means? I don't always. We have to shed our cultural lens, perhaps, to understand. And so he writes, given the limited good outlook in Mediterranean cultures, seeking more was actually considered morally wrong because the pie, all of the economy, was limited and already all distributed. Anyone getting more meant that someone else got less. Thus, honorable people in that society did not try to get more, and those who did were automatically considered thieves. To have gained, to have accumulated more than one started with, is to have taken the share of someone else. Further, he explains that it was common in this time for masters to ask their slaves to do things that they themselves would be held in contempt for. So asking the slaves to invest money to make significant profit was actually a way of retaining his reputation. He was hoping to get richer without staining his hands, perhaps. In this way, one can begin to see that the actions of the master perhaps are to be in question, rather than assuming that the master represents Jesus. And what about other biblical passages that speak about forbidding interest or lending when we shouldn't expect anything return as a foundation for interpreting, interpreting the parable in a different way? Arguably, there are kinder passages of scripture that contradict the common interpretation. Perhaps, just perhaps, the third slave is the only one who acted honorably acted honorably by being satisfied with what he was given, by protecting it, by not expecting to increase the wealth of his master. Now, any number of people will argue with me, or more, more aptly, the, the scholar that wrote this that I read. But I want us to get away from that argument. Don't try to just sort it out. Just set it aside for a second. Get out of your capitalistic Western bubble and think just maybe that for those that already have an abundance, it's not, all, it's not all cracked up to be just to have more. And for those that don't have as much, it's not so great, right? 
Maybe the interpretation we've grown up with is more of a convenient, convenient way to affirm society, where the ever-widening gap between those that have and those that don't is just. So today, let's talk about economic inclusion. Let's think about our middle, middle income norms, and let's think about our privilege and perhaps consider how we understand what it's like to live on a low income and how privilege among middle and higher income earners comes into play. Ruby Payne and her work called Bridges Out of Poverty helps clarify understanding around what opportunity people have based on their income. For example, when you think of food, someone living with low income might wonder, is there enough? Someone who is uh, living in middle, um, middle income might wonder, do I like it? And someone who is living with a higher income might wonder if it's presented well enough to eat. Can you see the distinctions there? When you think of money, someone with a low income might think money is to be used or spent whenever they have it, while a middle income earner might think about how to manage it or budget it. And a high income earner might think more about how to invest it just to make more. Someone with a low income may live mostly in the present moment, whereas a middle income person might be thinking a lot about the future. And a higher income earner might be thinking about their history, their traditions, or even their legacy. Can you see how income can influence the way that we see the world? It's not about class structure. I don't want you to think of that. You know, some people talk about this stuff and they talk about low class, middle class, high class. There's only one class. We're one people. But what we have makes a difference in terms of our viewpoint, our outlook on life. It can be easy for those of us, and I identify with this, with, middle, with a middle income point of view to judge others who have more or less to judge the way they manage time, the way they talk about money or they talk about food. And this judgment actually separates us. We're not here to try to make other people have the same norms as us. Can you work with me on that? In, a, in, a, in some writing about Ruby Payne's work, Bynum and Smith go on to say, when we judge ourselves against how others are doing, we're positioning ourselves on the ladder of social class. And I do this unconsciously every day. We probably all do. Perhaps we can change our gaze if we simply see income levels as fact, not a class structure. Perhaps we need to view these broad strokes not as things that, that should separate us. And Bynum and Smith say income level is about how stable our life is. Looking at income levels in a non-judgmental framework allows us to respect one another and evaluate the resources and challenges the resources and choices, rather, available to us that may not be available to others. It is in the fact, or it is in fact a starting point to actually help someone who's experiencing poverty. Respect them, their life, their way of being. Yeah, it's different. But that doesn't make it wrong. I want to see a world where everyone has the opportunity to have a positive future, and it's hard. Even when someone experiencing poverty wants to change their situation, quite typically, they are wrapped up in the immediacy of trying to solve the problems of today. It's the nature of the life in poverty to, uh, that tomorrow might not be here. In fact, having a sustainable income today for the rest of the day might not even be possible. It's like living in the tyranny of the moment or the tyranny of the urgent. The longer and deeper this moment-driven experience exists, the less likely it is for individuals to have access or think in terms of a future story. The community is often reluctant to value that experience. I know I am. For the individual living with low income, that sense of powerlessness often makes it hard to get much traction and make any personal changes, even if they want to. It's incredibly difficult to get out of poverty. It's like swimming upstream. Let's illustrate how our privilege makes it harder or easier to have a higher income. This is where you need your pencil and your paper. Yeah, I can. You're going to pass them out. Raise your hand if you need one and you didn't get one on the way in. So what I want you to do for every statement that I make, if it is true for you, I want you to put a little tick. So all you're doing is one tick at a time. And at the end of all the statements, you're going to have a certain number of ticks, and then you can add up how many you've got. 
Okay? So, if English is your first language, check mark or mark. If either of your parents graduated from higher, higher education, give yourself a mark. If your parents didn't, uh, get divorced. Now listen to the negative here. If you have never had to skip a meal because there was no food in the house, give yourself a check. If you don't have a visible or invisible disability, check. If you have a family doctor, check. If your work or school holidays coincide with the religious holidays that you personally celebrate, If you studied the culture and history of your ancestors in elementary school. If you've never, notice the neg negative again, been bullied for something you can't change. Perhaps your gender, ethnicity, your age, or your sexual orientation. Give yourself a mark. If you've never been passed over for employment or a promotion based on your gender, age, ethnicity, or sexual orientation. If you have ever been offered a job because of an association with a friend or a family member. If your family inherited money or property. If you or your parents were never laid off or unemployed. If you are a Canadian citizen. If you were never uncomfortable about a joke you overheard uh, that was directed toward your race, ethnicity, gender, or appearance. If your ancestors came to Canada by choice. If you didn't have to take out loans to get post-secondary education. If there were more than 50 books in your house growing up. If you have never felt unsafe walking home. If you're white. And if you're a white male, an extra point. There were 22 statements. The higher your number, quite simply, the more privilege you have. Now often this exercise is actually done in an open field. So imagine you're asked to participate in a race. Now imagine that the starting line between is determined by taking steps forward or steps back based on the very questions that I just asked you. I'm sure you can picture it, right? Some people will have a significant head start. Some will be in the middle. Some will be further behind. The exercise, of course, is designed to help us understand how privileged we are and how it helps us get a head start, making it more likely that you will win, right? If you scored high, your head start was, was, um, was the greatest, okay? And you're more likely to win, a little bit like having the bags of gold, right? For a moment, imagine if your life if you answered no to many or most of those statements, how would you feel? How hard would it be to get ahead? Now in the parable of gold, or the parable of the bags of gold rather, think about yourself as one of the slaves who received a bag as it relates to your own privilege or your own income. I think most of us would be the servant who was given the most, the biggest bag of gold. At least I am. Mainly in this room, we're white, educated, middle income with plenty of opportunity. Not everyone, but mainly. Hopefully we've acted wisely thus far and we've used our privilege for good. I think we try to do that here at Avalon. That's part of who we are, right? Perhaps we're, we're not gonna just try to expand our own wealth, of course. But rather, we're gonna use our time and talent to help others with less gold. 
Can we stretch ourselves to understand what it means to begin with less privilege, to be bound by your income with little opportunity to change our circumstances? Just imagine yourself, again, in that race, struggling. Now, near the beginning of my message, I shared with you a portion of the covenant. Here it is again. Belonging. Creating and nurturing a culture where all people can experience belonging, regardless of their gender, ethnicity, age, sexual orientation, or with our little addition, their income. For us to truly create a place where belonging occurs here at Avon, it requires some personal sacrifice. It requires us to recognize our privilege and use it for good. It requires us to change our language. It requires us to share, even if it means less opportunity for ourselves. Do you have people in your life who are not middle income earners, or at least different from you in some way, perhaps, sexual orientation or gender? Have you invested at least some of your time in building an authentic relationship? Or as Ruby Payne would call it, a bridge out of poverty? Because when you do, you learn, you change, you grow. It's not about trying to change the other person. <laughs> it's about building a connection. And as we embrace diversity, all of us are the better for it. Now, I need to work on this as much or more than any of us here. I am not standing up here trying to tell you that I'm better. There's no question. I'm humbly standing before you saying I'm working on this. But as we hope, we hold out hope, we can move towards a better future for everyone. We can hold each other up. We can continue to work toward creating this covenant culture in our community that we've committed to. So I hope today you've learned a little bit about your privilege, about what it means to live the way that we do in our society and our community. Together, let's uh, work towards sharpening us ourselves, right? We're here together to learn from each other. We're here together to push each other. That's what the community is all about. And if my message was uncomfortable for you, that's okay. You can talk to me about that too. I'm not always right. <laughs> uh, but I do hope that we can understand that our words matter, the things we say in our covenant matters, and the actions that we take as a community make a big difference too. Amen. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world I have to name, I see the stars.
Sings my soul. 